We're discussing the Dirac picture. This is uh, required or this is implemented when you can split the Hamiltonian into two pieces. Eventually, this V will be identified with the time dependent potential when we introduce them. However, for the time being, let's not put any constraint on it. Let's say that we have two terms. The full Hamiltonian is decomposed into two terms. And H0 is sort of the known part. It's not a perturbation theory. It's an exact treatment. But the point that I'm using this argument is to show that instead of the full Hamiltonian, we can use this part of the Hamiltonian to generate a new picture, which is going to be intermediate between the Heisenberg and the Schrodinger. And what we do then is define this unitary operator I over h bar h zero t using that just as h zero part, and define the states and the observables accordingly using the index i standing for the interaction. This picture is also called interaction picture, for as, as I said for the future uh, implications. So we define a i a Schrodinger a u inverse as before, u is that explicit expression, and the state is defined as the u and psi Schrodinger. And then we have started investigating uh, the time dependence features of these new entities by just acting on them with the derivative operators, and we have discovered that this both states and the observables evolve in time, but the generators of the time evolution for states and observables are different. For the states, it is the potential written in the interaction picture in this, according to this recipe. And the observables obey the Perhaps I should also, although it is not necessary to overemphasize, to put these time dependences in. Notice that these two equations are similar respectively to the Schrodinger equation, the first one, and to the Heisenberg equation of motion, the second one. Both states and observables evolve in time. That's a very interesting, <coughs> interesting picture. Eventually, we'll see why it is a very useful one for the time to discuss the time-dependent problems. And we have to also uh, discuss some of the physical properties that we have seen before for the Heisenberg picture. These are trivial statements, <clears throat> but we have to <clears throat> really take them into account. The H0 is the same in, is the same as, same in both pictures. That's, that's the simple statements. That is, let's put them in blocks. H0 is the same. That is, whatever H0 is in the Schrodinger picture, it is the same in the interaction picture. That's the meaning of it. But that doesn't apply to V. V changes. So let's make this important. But V is different. And I have to emphasize that it is this V in the interaction picture which enters into that equation. As they are different, we have to emphasize that. The second important object, well, what it buys for us, if you want. What are the consequences? We have seen a previous thing happening in the Heisenberg picture. Let me repeat it here, that is, is crucial. Now, notice that this equation is a simple equation in principle, provided that we understand, ah, 
I'm, I apologize, put that H0 in here, please correct it. H, full H was in the Heisenberg, in the interaction it's the H0, right? As we have said, there are two different generators of time. So the question arises, in order to compute those, that right hand side and compute the commutator, you need to know how to compute that commutator. You may say, what? It's a trivial statement, isn't it? It is not. Because this A depends on time, and you don't know what is the time that has to be put in in H0. However, this statement, which is based on a simple half a minute derivation based on that derivation, shows that H0 is the same in both pictures. And what is the consequences? What is the natural consequence of that? It is time independence in interaction picture as well. In I picture. Right? If it is the same as the Schrodinger picture operator, it must be time independent. Therefore, I can assign any time I like to it. I can assign any time I like. Therefore, when I'm computing that commutator, it's natural that Perhaps I have to use a different color, that's an important point. I have to take it to be at the same time as the A appearing next to it. Okay, so, you say why we do have to do anything like that? That is based on a second observation. The second observation is that equal time commutators Transform like the observables themselves. I have, I didn't state it in this systematic and simple form last time. Let me elaborate a little bit. Although we have done it for the specific operators like X's and P's, X's with X's, P's with P's, and X's with P's, and we have already observed that when you take those operators at different times, they are different operators. They do not commute themselves among themselves. So this is a more general statement than that. This is true for any observable. What I mean is that if you take an, two operators, of course, they have to be of observable nature, right? We are talking about observables, the Hermitian linear operators whose eigenvalues are real, etc., etc. So they are not just any operators from the hat. And if we take them at equal time, at equal time, and take compute that commutator, this has that property. That is, I can write it as u. A, B, when there are no time dependence or no indices, it is in the obvious the Schrodinger picture, it obeys that relationship. As I said, the point to emphasize is that these T's are the same, and this theorem is valid only when the T's are the same. If they are at different time, of course there's no clean way of computing it. Forget such a beautiful consequence. There is no clean way of computing them. So we have that beautiful theorem in hand, which naturally leads to the fact that basic Heisenberg algebra, notice that I'm not talking about Heisenberg algebra, Heisenberg picture, Heisenberg comp. There are several things that I'm talking about here. Basic Heisenberg algebra, that is x with x is zero, p with p is zero, x with p is i h bar delta i j. That is, remember, what's called the basic Heisenberg algebra. That basic Heisenberg algebra holds at equal times. Again, remind you that this we have proven for the Heisenberg picture case as well. That is why, because of this beautiful theorem, I prefer to take the time of the H0, which I am free to do so, to be the same time as the AI itself. Then you can compute those commutators using those basics. 
A third bullet, perhaps, is that for any observable, the interaction picture expectation value is the same as the Schrodinger picture expectation value. We have previously shown that it's the same as the Heisenberg picture expectation value, or for that matter, any picture expectation value. Well, that's good. Otherwise, we would be in trouble, and what we would be doing would be totally nonsense. So as these expectation values are the physical ones, physical things that you measure in the laboratory, and they coincide with the classical expressions, it is gratifying that there is such a simple and beautiful theorem valid. Otherwise, as I said, what would be doing would be total nonsense. So based on these, we can, uh, if you want, we can try to address a problem in this picture. We are, okay, let me summarize. Now we have three pictures in hand. One is the Schrodinger picture in which the states evolve in time, observables are frozen. Second is the Heisenberg picture in which observables this time evolve in time, states are frozen. And here both evolve in time. Obviously, this is richer than any of them, and this is more, probably more interesting, as we will see eventually in discussing the time-dependent potentials in general and the perturbation theory, especially. Now, I think uh, we can uh, move to a different issue as we have this finished the formal discussion of the pictures, and we have also seen a simple example in the Heisenberg case. We have addressed the free particle problem and a little bit of the harmonic oscillator problem. There, I remember assigning your private homework, asking you to reproduce physical results that you obtain in the Schrodinger picture, which are energy eigenvalues, energy eigenfunctions. And what would be the, a similar result in this new picture, in the Heisenberg, that is? You have to reproduce the quantized energy eigenvalues using that picture, using that equation of motion. If you haven't done so, please do that. I asked Idris to elaborate a little bit on it uh, on, uh, today. If he can hold it, he had other things, I guess perhaps he, he's going to. Did he send you an email? telling you whether there will be a uh, recitation this evening or not. There's a little slight chance that he may postpone it till after the biome. But anyway, if he does, he is going to let you do, let you know. There you, what we have done, I have, what I have shown last time briefly is that you can solve the X's and P's in the Heisenberg picture as a function of time. These are operator expressions. In terms of the Schrodinger picture operators X and P, when there is no time dependence, they are the Schrodinger picture operators. But then we stopped there because it was a simple exercise that I was trying to illustrate the use of those equations. But I, actually, if you want to get something physical, you have to be able to re reproduce the energy condensation condition, right? En is equal to h bar omega times n plus a half. That's the most crucial aspect of the simple harmonic oscillator in quantum theory. So please try to reproduce that. Pushing the, uh, further using those X's and P's that you have computed, and you can uh, cre introduce creation and annulation operators, and take advantage of the X's, the commutation relations between X and P, convert them into commutation relation between A and A, a dagger, Compute the Hamiltonian in terms of these A's and A daggers, etc. Then you should be able to really through that pathway. That's a different avenue, but it should lead to the same physics. That's what I, I would like to emphasize. Anyway, that I leave you to enjoy yourself in, in your free time, and hopefully you may get hopefully a little bit of help from Idris. If not, you have to do it on your own, or else perhaps I can do it at some time. Okay. So the next sub subject we turn our attention to is the time evolution problem. You will need that eventually for the time-dependent perturbation theory, time evolution problem. Well, obviously, time evolution problem is based on the existence of 
time-dependent equations for physical quantities. But this particular evolution thing is defined for the states. Remember the basic paradigm shift from classical to quantum? The, one of the basic paradigm shifts, perhaps the most basic, was the change of the concept of state. There, in classical physics, the states were defined in terms of the dynamical variables for each degree of freedom. Here now there's a different thing. There's this is called, called state function, which is a vector in an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. And the central equation there was IH bar d by dt. The central equation I say because really this is the starting point of the quantum mechanics or quantum theory. And we have no uh, indices. It means it's the so-called Schrodinger picture, the default one. You have a state defined as such as an abstract vector in Hilbert space. You have operators corresponding to dynamical variables. They are linear Hermitian operators, not any operators, to have real eigenvalues so that you can establish contact with physics and the classical one. And then, of course, when you say this is the state, then you have to define how this state evolves in time. Why do we need that? This, there is a dynamics, right? Even free particles, when you let them alone, either they're going to stay at rest or they will continue moving, right? According to the basic principles of inertia. I don't want to call them Newton's principle because that basic principle of inertia is valid in both classical and quantum paradigms. So eventually, through these step-by-step -step development of this beautiful scheme, they have developed an equation like that. H is the Hamiltonian operator, which is obviously the generator of the time evolution. Then, uh, this is a first degree differential equation, as I have mentioned probably several times before. That's according to the general theory of differential equations. The solution to this one, formal solution obviously we are talking about, will depend on an arbitrary constant. In mathematicians' terminology, an initial condition, right? If there is a first degree differential operator, you need one initial condition. If you increase the degrees of the equation to second, like the Newton's equation, you need two initial conditions. There are x and x dot, or when x is the variable, or y and y dot, whichever you call. Here it's first degree, so life is simple. I need one initial condition. What is that initial condition? Well, obviously, that initial condition will be this. If I know this, I, by solving that equation, I can predict the value of the psi t precisely. I don't know whether I have mentioned this subtle detail, but this means causality, and causality principle is valid in quantum theory. What is not that valid in quantum theory is the determinism. It's loosened a little bit from the exact deterministic nature. Then you move from the exact deterministic scheme of the classical physics to this probabilistically deterministic quantum theory, but causality is valid. Once you know this, you can predict that is, you can compute psi t uniquely, and the formal solution to this one is, well, perhaps I have to make it more general. Let's say t0, instead of saying simply 0, that t0 can always be chosen to be 0, obviously. So it is going to be written, that formal solution will be written as such. That is given, this is predicted or computed because the equation is, is perfectly causal and you are able to do so. Well, that is the time evolution problem in mathematical terminology. So you can really, if you, meaning that you solve that equation formally and get an expression of that sort. And our next task will be to construct that operator u and perhaps we have to quickly deduce some of its mathematical properties from physics. So I will uh, talk, I will uh, do the following. I will list the physical properties here that I will elaborate on. And what are the mathematical properties which follow from those mathematical ones?
Okay. What is the first physical property of you? The first physical property that states stay normalized under time evolution. Let me briefly write it. State, stay, normalized. Uh, let me skip the under time evolution. Well, that, because that's time evolution that we are talking about anyway. And we have to deduce what mathematical property follow from this. I will show that the mathematical property which follow from here is that this operator u is unitary. Well, by now you are very familiar with this, right? Norm preservation imply unitarity or vice versa. If you start from that mathematical property that you have, you have a unitary operator, you hit on the state, you know that the normalization of that state is not going to be spoiled. It's going to be retained. It's going to be preserved. So normal, preservation of normalization is, has a counterpart in mathematical terminology that U is unitary. So when we start constructing the U, we know that it's going to be uh, we have to construct a unitary operator. The second property is a no evolution, no evolution case is obviously included in here, right? If you hit, if you watch it and you don't do any operation on it, then states will stay the same. It's not going to move in time. Well, obviously that says that there is an operator corresponding to it, u equals identity. So if you hit the state by the identity operator, obviously you don't create any change. This, that no evolution is included in this framework. You don't, you're not going to always have evolution. Sometimes you, you may have no evolution. And you can have evolution in uh, many steps. In many consequential, uh, many steps, that's enough, I guess. I don't have to write it in detail. That is, either you can make a single shot, one evolution, or you can go there in uh, several steps, reaching again to the same final state. And these two, you cannot distinguish. It must be equal to the same. Because the initial state is the same, the final state is the same. Whether you go there in a single shot or in many consequential steps, we shouldn't change the physics. The final state wouldn't know whether you came there in a single shot or in many intermediate, through many intermediate steps. That's the physics. And in mathematics, it means the product of any two, uh, two uh, evolutions, ordered, time-ordered evolutions, is equivalent to another evolution. That is, I can symbolically write it as u1 times u2 is equal to two, u3. This is not a pre precise way of writing. I'm going to write it eventually in precise way because I know that u's are by local in time. They depend in the, on the initial time and they depend on the final time. Therefore, u's are interesting. You have to write two indices, but these are continuous time indices, not discrete uh, label indices, okay? But anyway, two steps. Perhaps I have to write it a little cleanly. Yes, it can be visible, right? u1 times u2 is equivalent to u3. As I said, I will fill in the details. Now, once you have these mathematical properties, you may wish to construct those that you explicitly. Again, that is you are constructing a formal solution to that equation. Constructing U means that, uh, constructing a formal solution to the equation, right? Well, in the past, I have gone through some uh, uh, details. Now I'm going, I'll try to skip those details and I will try to get into the business directly. Let's see whether we can do that. So let's consider an infinitesimal transition, infinitesimal. 
evolution. Infinitesimality in mathematics is a, a serious subject, right? That's the calculus of infinitesimals discovered by, this, oh, this also was discovered by Newton, co-discovered and Leibniz. The notation we are using is due to Leibniz. Well, it means you retain only first order terms. If, uh, and how they are defined in mathematics? Well, in math there's a rigorous definition in mathematics, physics. We say that 10 to the minus 20 seconds is an infinitesimal as compared to the seconds, right? Why I say 10 to the minus 20 seconds? Well, that is the time it takes for the light to cross an atom, for instance. You have smallness and largeness measured in nature. And these kind of smallness and uh, largeness are the important physical things. Mathematicians, they say, it is so small that the, the square of them is, can be neglected. You know, that's a, also a very nice definition. So in this infinitesimal computation or construction of the U, we have to retain only the first order terms in what? Well, in the infinitesimal, sorry, infinitesimal quantity that we consider. It is the time evolution, therefore time is the variable. What we do here is that you have a t0, for instance, time. You start and evolve into a neighboring time which differs from it by only a dt amount. That's an infinitesimally small time interval. That's the interval. OK. So how do I construct the u representing that infinitesimal transition? Obviously, the notation for the u will be t0 plus dt and t0. Remember, this is the initial time that you set out and you reach to that time, as described in that picture. So let's use some basic physics and mathematics intermingled. If dt goes to 0, if I shrink the second point to the initial point, it corresponds to a no transition case, right? Because time doesn't evolve and there is no transition. It stays there if time doesn't evolve, neither does the u. t evolves and u evolves accordingly in the space of Hilbert space, right? There's a time space and Hilbert space. Time evolves and there's an evolution in the Hilbert space. So in order to take that into account that in that limit, I will have t0 and t0 and it's going to be no transition identity. And the amount, the additional amount which I have to add to this should be proportional to the infinitesimal amount of the time that I am considering, right? It is this dt which should come in. So there will be an additional piece which is going to depend on the dt explicitly so that if I take this to zero, I will recover i in order to ensure that. So all, everything else is, is an unknown whose properties I have to deduce yet. Well, this is what I'm trying to deduce, to construct, and I construct it in terms of another unknown which I have introduced. And that will be the basic point, essential point of the f of following discussion. So in order to make sure that this comes out to be exactly what I expected it to be, that's the Hamiltonian, so I have to put the signs and everything accordingly. Or else the, it comes out to be h bar over i times, h bar over i times the Hamiltonian, so let I inexpectancy of the future correct result, I define it that way. So the next issue is what is this H, Charlie H? Well, let's first make some observation about its properties. We can immediately prove that it is Hermitian. The way I defined it, it's Hermitian. If I define it without those additional niceties, that is plus times h, then it will come out to be anti-Hermitian. But with this definition, through this definition, it will come out to be Hermitian. h is Hermitian as a first step. The second step, I have to demonstrate that h is the Hamiltonian. 
of the starting point. It's nice, isn't it, that it's the Hamiltonian? Okay, let's prove them in uh, step by step. Let's, this, both of them are easy. So we, let's start with the logical one, the first one. As we prove that it is the Hermitian thing, then obviously the natural candidate will be the Ham Hamiltonian itself. Okay. How do I prove that it's Hermitian? I have to use the fact these deduced properties that it's unitary, right? Norm preservation forced us, and well, it necessitated that U is unitary. The unitarity of the U guarantees that this curly H is Hermitian. So if I write the hermeticity property for this infinitesimal construct and retain only the first order terms, infinitesimal calculus, let's see what we get. U is that, what is the U dagger? It is two, sum of two terms. I is identity is real. Therefore, U dagger is identity. There was minus I over H bar. I, when I take the conjugate becomes plus i over h bar. h becomes the h dagger. dt is real. So this is the u dagger I get from that. And if I multiply it with the u that was already constructed, this should be equal to 1. Let's expand the right hand side. There is the identity from the first to first. There is the second group of terms, which is dagger minus HDT. And there are terms of second order. Now, by now, you are used to this notation of mine. Order, O is for order, DT squared. And they, are, should, they should be left out, right? And what is left over then? I's in both sides cancel, and you have that additional term, which should vanish, obviously, in order left-hand side is the same as the right-hand side. This is equal to zero, which means h dagger is equal to h, as promised. U is unitary, curly h is her mission. Very nice. The next step will be to demonstrate that it is the Hamiltonian. Let's do that. OK, let me consider the evolution equation for the case I have, I'm, which is under study. So let me write now the evolution equation, that equation, for this specific case. So what is the left-hand side? It is t0 plus dt, right? And right-hand side is u t0 plus dt. T0, starting point is T0, evolving to T0 plus dt, as in the picture, as in the figure. Initial point is this. Well, actually, I will lift the point zero, not to give you the impression that it is valid only at a given initial point, OK? So you can think of any arbitrary point, and move to a neighboring point by dt amount. So let me, as a, in the equation, also erase that, not to confuse ourselves, whether this is a very special statement. So this is the infinitesimal form. The only point is that we start with an arbitrary t and move to a neighboring point. So this one we have already constructed. Now we have the advantage of knowing that this the curly H is her mission. We have them approved that it's her mission. Now right hand side is done. What about the left hand side? 
Well, obviously, the left-hand side can be expanded into Taylor series, any mathematical entity, whether it's a function, C function, or Q function, or operator, or state vector, we can always expand it in a Taylor series, which is Taylor series, and retain only the first order terms, because this one is infinitesimal. So what is the Taylor series expansion of this? The first term is psi of t. You don't have any difficulty in appreciating it, right? If you have, you go to a basis, say, like a position eigenvector basis, go from the abstract Hilbert space to wave function, and expand, it, expand the wave function in t, and then go back to the state vector business. This is a short detour. But I guess this also you must be quite comfortable with, right? So then the second term is the additional one is dt, and the Taylor series obviously required that is psi of t. And plus, but that is second order terms. Write it as second orders. And infinitesimal calculus, we retain only the first order terms. So it, the left hand side is an expansion, and so is right hand side. Let me write the right hand side fully now. The i, I times psi is psi t minus i over h bar times curly h times dt times psi of t. How nice. Of course, there will be, there may be second order terms, but we have written it in the infinitesimal form. Here's the left and right hand sides equated as such, obviously, the leading term sides are identical. The second terms are proportional dt, so you equate the coefficients of the dt. d by dt psi t is equal to minus i over h bar h sine of t. How nice. So this curly h, which I have just introduced as an unknown in that construction, when I substituted in the original formal expression, gave me this equation. Now if I compare this with that default equation that we have all started with, you see that H is nothing but the Hamiltonian. These two equations become identical then. Beautiful. So we have really a formal solution to the time evolution equation in the Hilbert space, but only for the infinitesimal case, right? That's where we are now. So u t plus dt, and t is i minus identity minus i over h bar. Now I can comfortably put the Hamiltonian in. So a beautiful expression indeed. Now how do I integrate this to get the finite? the evolution operator corresponding to a finite transition. Well, there are several ways of doing it. Uh, let me describe both of them. One is uh, a shortcut mathematical argument. Second one is a more physical argument based on the fact the third property that we have deduced for the U that Either you can make a single shot transition or you go through many intermediate steps, the final state wouldn't know this. It's the same, regardless of the, how many steps that you go through. Well, in principle, I can take a finite interval of time and subdivide it into infinitesimal pieces and eventually let that size of that infinitesimal piece goes to zero dt, that is, or the number which is obtained by dividing the full line into dt's, there is a number of those pieces. Either you let the 
length of the interval go to zero, number of the intervals go to infinity, whichever. Okay, this, this is the argument. So let me use both of them. As I said, they are both educated. So let me use the simple, the first simple argument that is, but anyway, both of them depend on the following. Observe. Now, in Schrodinger picture, we are in a default now. Schrodinger picture, H is time independent, right? That's the definition of the picture, as all the other observables. As all the other observables. So, what do I have? Uh, what is the advantage of that uh, observation? The observation has the following advantage. If I start now from a T0 and go to a final point which I label as T, then my ultimate purpose is to find the U which would take me directly from the initial t to final t, but using that closure property or group property that I can go through as many intermediate steps I like. So I subdivide this into in equal length intervals. n minus 1, perhaps, is much better. Because we have to go through this counting. T n minus 1. The final t is the tn, obviously. How many dividers? n minus 1 dividers. Correct? 1, 2, blah, blah, n minus, n minus 1. t0 is the initial point fixed. t is the final point fixed. I have n minus 1 intermediate points. And how many intervals? n is the number of intervals. 1, 2, n minus 1, and n. You count from the left. So please pay attention to this mismatch. This mismatch is uh, an important mismatch. If you skip it, you make a mistake. It is not. OK, sometimes these things happen, particularly when you go through path integral formulation. I do it in 431, 32, but not in here, because I presume most of you have seen something like 432. So you have seen path integrals. So this discussion plays such a beautiful role in there. Anyway, forget it. This mathematics. So what is the u associated in this generic interval. That's a generic interval. I label it with the index i and i plus 1. Obviously, all of them have the equal length dt, 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 dt. So uh, what is the number of intervals? n is t minus t0 divided by dt. Or if you want, that's a stupid, simple arithmetics, but that's also something that you have to remember, right? t minus t0 divided by n, not n minus 1. The number of intervals are n. And what about this now, u? This u is i, i over h bar capital H times dt. And what about here? It's the same. What about here? It's the same. Why it's the same? h is time independent. The only uh, quantity which would create any trouble for us is the Hamiltonian H. But like any other observable, they are time independent. Therefore, the H's in all each subintervals are the same. Therefore, U is the same. So you see, I put no index on H. H doesn't have to carry any index associated with this particular interval. Nice. Therefore, what is the U that I expect to get? u t t0 will be now the product of the this one and that one and that one and that one all of them 
why u1 and u2 would be directly u3. Here there are u1, u2, u3, u blah blah, un is equal to the final u. And also I have to take the limit n goes to infinity. So i minus i over h bar h dt times n. What is n? n is the number of intervals. One, two, three, I go all the way to intervals. Well, I am more or less done. If I write now that dt is t minus t0 divided by n, this becomes very much like the following expression. 1 minus x over n to the power n. Now x, perhaps to emphasize that, it is not a C number, but it's an operator. I write the capital X. And it's like the little x. Little x is C number, right? It, it's valid for expo ordinary exponential functions like e to the x. But this is like e to the a. a is an operator. So this has that form. What is the x? It is i over h bar times the Hamiltonian. What is that limit equal to? That's a beautiful mathematical theorem, right? That's the definition of the exponential. If there is a plus in here, the sign is plus. If there is minus, as is the case in here, minus. That is a beautiful, one of the beautiful definitions of the exponential operator. So what do I have then? I have the following. u, t, and t0 is equal to minus i over h bar h t minus t0. Done beautifully. Isn't that amazing that we have been able to solve this or starting point of our equation, Schrodinger equation, formally using a beautiful set of mathematical and physical steps all intermingled. Uh, obviously, if you really try to solve it directly, now you would go into nonsensical steps. But I remember once there was one of those important figures when I was a very young faculty assistant professor. And he was at the top of one of the organizations. And he came one day and gave us a little talk down there. He divided the operators by the operators, you know, matrices by the matrices. So uh, if we do that nonsense in here, d psi dt divided by psi vector, then you can have an expression of that sort, right? I over h bar times capital H, and you integrate, you get something like that. Sometimes nonsense may lead to sensible looking results, but nonsense is nonsense. That is the solution that we have to follow, and we have this beautiful result. That's the time evolution operator, this formal solution to the Schrodinger equation. So it's a good, point to give a short break.